Welcome to this edition of Go Vote Omaha, presented by the League of Women Voters of Greater Omaha. I'm Rachel Gibson, Vice President of Action for the League of Women Voters of Nebraska, and I will be facilitator for tonight's conversation. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization and does not endorse political candidates or parties. Our purpose is to empower voters and defend democracy. Go Vote Omaha focuses on policy issues. As a result of our discussions, we hope you will be ready to make an informed decision during election time. Tonight is the second of two sessions to hear from candidates for the state legislature running in different Omaha metro area districts. Our objective is for voters to hear about issues and policies directly from candidates in a nonpartisan environment. To find out what district you are in and what candidate will be on your ballot this November, visit vote411.org. Organized and published by the League of Women Voters of Nebraska Volunteers, vote411.org is a one-stop shop for election-related information. It provides specifics about the election process, details and general state candidate information, and information from the candidates themselves who have responded to the vote411.org questionnaire. As an organization is committed to transparency, we want to be clear about our process. We invited all candidates from the Omaha metro area state legislative races. Candidates were provided two date options and were contacted several times. We engaged all candidates equally. Some did not respond, some could not attend due to schedule, and some declined. Due to the number of candidates who did indicate interest, a second session took place earlier this month with a different set of candidates for state legislature. The opponents of three of the candidates here tonight participated at the earlier event. The candidates here tonight and at the previous conversation are those who were willing and able to connect with voters through the league hosted event. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. We really do appreciate you. Mm -hmm. The format tonight also utilizes methods to ensure equitability and transparency. As facilitator, I will ask a series of questions that each candidate will have equal time to respond to. The order was determined by a drawing, and the first speaker will shift for each question. All right, so we will go ahead and jump in. We're in order uh, here, starting at the top of the table closest to me. Uh, we'll start with introductions. So if you'd like to start, one minute introduction, and we'll just go down the row. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Merv Reepy. I'm a legislative candidate for District 12 again. My story is that I was born and raised on a farm. Uh, at the age of 17, I, two weeks out of high school, I joined the U.S. Navy. I was a hospital corpsman, and following an honorable discharge, I came back to Omaha. I went to school and uh, subsequently went and became a hospital administrator at Bergen Mercy Hospital for 18 years children's hospital for 15. When I was at uh, Bergen Mercy, I served for five years as chief operating officer and for a period of time, 18 months as the chief executive officer. Following my retirement from children's, I ran for office in 2014 for the state legislature and I was fortunate enough that I won. While in the legislature, I served, was elected by my peers, which is a feat in and of itself to uh, serve as chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee. I lost my election in 2018 when I re-ran, so at that time then I ran for the school board at, uh, at Ralston and I currently serve there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michaela Cavanaugh. I represent District 6 in West Central Omaha and I'm running for re-election. I've served in the Nebraska legislature for four years, and I s serve currently on the Health and Human Services Committee and Transportation and Telecommunications. My area of focus over the last four years has been pre pre predominantly focused on child welfare, maternal and infant health, and making sure that every child in Nebraska has access to high quality education. I am proud of a lot of the things that we have accomplished over the last four years, but I'm most proud of this last year passing the Family Support Waiver for Children with Developmental Disabilities. Our Developmental Disability Waiver System in Nebraska is very complex and needs a lot more work, and I'm excited that our Health and Human Services Committee is working on that over this interim, and I look forward to the opportunity to continue my work in developmental disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, my name is John Fredrickson and I am a candidate to represent District 20 in the legislature. I grew up here in Omaha and I am so grateful that I did. I had a family that loved me 
I had a community that really cared about me, and I had teachers that truly invested in me. I'm a mental health provider by profession. I have a private practice where I do counseling services, and this was a huge driver as to why I decided to run for office. We currently do not have any mental health subject matter experts in our legislative body, and I think that's a perspective that's extraordinarily valuable as it pertains to mental health policy, but also as it pertains to healthcare policy, education policy, and any other policy that affects people's day-to-day -day lives. I'm also a parent. My husband and I have a three and a half year old son, so schools are really important to our family. And I'm also super interested in Nebraska's future. I think there's a number of ways we can think about Nebraska's future, but one is thinking about policies that we can implement that can attract and retain talent in our state so that we have a sustainable future, both economically and culturally. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cindy Maxwell Ostick, and I'm an independent. I'm running for Nebraska Legislature in District 4, which is West Omaha. And I'm a mom. I have three kids. They're in 8th, 9th, and 10th grade right now. And my husband and I operate a small business from our family office, our home office. I am someone who has a specialty and background in HR and executive recruiting and have been focused on the legislature and studying it for several years now. In fact, I'm a co-founder of a legislative study group and am president of Rank the Vote Nebraska. I have also helped and um, been very pleased to be an advisory board member for Nonpartisan Nebraska and volunteered with Civic Nebraska for nonpartisan poll observing. So I am very focused on elect elections and voting and I'm very excited to earn the vote of District 4 neighbors and I uh, would love to answer any more questions. Thanks. Well, wonderful. That was a great segue. We will jump right in with questions. Um, we're going to start with a doozy, and we're just going to keep going. So the first question <laughs> is, several senators stated that they intend to bring legislation to further loosen gun restrictions in Nebraska. What do you think is the appropriate level of regulation? And we're starting this time with Senator Kelly. Thank you. Um, so I am aware, as I um, worked to make sure that we didn't move forward this year's gun restrictions in Nebraska, I believe that what we have currently is sufficient as far as loosening of restrictions. I would like to see us investing more in mental health services and background checks and red flag laws. Um, I have introduced legislation previously to help victims of domestic violence so that their perpetrators do not have as easy of access to guns and weapons. I do believe that the bill that was brought this last year was not great for our law enforcement and our law enforcement was very outspoken about that and that is one of the many, many reasons that I did not support that piece of legislation. And I hope that we can have sensible gun regulation while also honoring the fact that this is a constitutional right in our country. And I think that we can do both at the same time. So thank you. Thank you. All right, to me? All right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, the reality is um, gun ownership comes with responsibility. And I think part of that responsibility is ensuring that we can keep our society safe from gun violence. I'm a proponent of legislation that has common sense gun policies like universal background checks, uh, safe storage requirements, red flag laws, and safety training. And I want to speak to this a little bit from a mental health perspective. Um, one of my expertise is in suicide and suicide prevention. And we see time and again when an individual has easy access to means for suicide that drastically increases risk. So having policies in place like safe storage requirements can help decrease um, behavior that might be a result of impulsivity or high emotion. So I'm a proponent for um, gun policies that frankly are, are very, very popular to keep our society safe. How do I follow that? <laughs> I agree very much with uh, everything that's been said so far. I am um, very concerned about gun violence in our country and in our state and have been uh, someone who's experienced the weight of the worry about this for my kids. Um, my oldest actually is the same age as the kids at Cindy Sandy Hook Elementary. And so all three of my children have attended school with uh, prop, prop, uh, the right word is processes in place 
to you know, be worried about intruders and um, uh, it's very stressful. I actually had uh, my child come home the other day with a form that was describing what to do in those sorts of emergencies and it's something that I really want us to focus on here in Nebraska. I do believe in the Second Amendment, but we do need common sense regulations. Thanks. I am a, a supporter of the Second Amendment. I also believe that uh, the concealed carry law that's there is still in debate. Uh, I can't sp specifically, I've not read that particular piece of legislation. And the one thing that's important about all pieces of legislation, having been there before, is you always have to look for the shells and the must and the ands and everything else before you can settle in on what it is exactly. Uh, I am concerned about many of the stolen guns that are in the uh, community, in this community and other communities. So we have to somewhere or another figure out how we can address those as well. I would like to say too is that I do have the endorsement of the Omaha Police Officers Association and one of the pieces I've worked with Senator Brewer before, it's his bill that's, that's on the floor, and uh, I want to make sure that the urban area's concerns are addressed as well as the rural. Thank you. We will move on to our next question, and Mr. Fredrickson, this will start with you. Will you work to preserve the nonpartisan nature of our unicameral, and if so, how? I will. Um, I think that, you know, what, one of my favorite parts about Nebraska is the fact that we have a nonpartisan unicameral. Um, we're the only state in our country that has that. And I think that that's extraordinarily important. Um, when we have a nonpartisan body, um, if you are going to be effective, the reality is you are going to have to work with folks from a, a diverse uh, spectrum of political beliefs. And so, um, you know, I think that that introduces and passes legislation that is in the best interest of Nebraskans and not the priority of partisan par uh, parties. So I am a big proponent of the nonpartisan body and I will work to preserve that. I'm originally from Iowa and am someone who moved to Nebraska as a young woman and have been such a fan of our nonpartisan unicameral. I believe it is really a model and wish that other states also followed this process. As a nonpartisan, I'm very concerned about some of the um, policies that have been pr proposed and would want to make sure and protect the unicameral. I would not think it would be a good idea to move to two houses again. And as someone who testified regarding a uh, proposed legislation that would have taken our elections partisan for the legislature, I was actually very against that, especially as not only someone who votes as a nonpartisan, but as a candidate. I believe that I will represent District 4 neighbors and listen to what they need and not be beholden to party politics. I would start off by saying that I am a proponent of open votes for committee memberships, which relates to the uh, <clears throat> unicameral. Uh, in terms of it being nonpartisan, I think we find that, uh, I don't know whether it's divided by Republicans and Democrats or whether it's divided by conservatives and, and uh, progressives, but there is a partisan nature to the, the quote unquote nonpartisan unicamera. Uh, many of the times that the votes are aligned, uh, most of the Democratic senators, if not all, I think all, are from the Lincoln and Omaha area. And uh, the rural is made up of mostly Republicans. Another piece of this is the Republican Party is two divided, divided pieces. One of them are the urban Republicans and the other one are the rural Republicans, so that there's a lot of division and mixed that go on between those. I, also, I was just going to say, there, if I may, there's a mayor of Baltimore made a, a quote one time that I like to express, and that is, always keep friendship in your voice. And that fa the father is the father of Nancy Pelosi, so I thought I'd toss that one in. Uh, I love our nonpartisan legislature. I think that it is a gift to the state, and I agree with um, Cindy that I would like to see others adopt the process. I appreciate what um, 
Merv is saying about the partisanship within the chamber. But as somebody who is in the minority party within the legislative chamber, I see so much value in it. Um, last, in 2021, my resolution to create a special investigative oversight committee into child welfare had 40 votes. And it was because I was able to work so closely with the speaker of the legislature and the chairman of my committee that we were able to work together to accomplish something really significant in this state. And I think that it is important to remember that we are able to work together because we don't have that caucus system that you see in that toxic environment that you see on the national scale. All right, so we will move on to our next question. Again, gonna just keep going with the heavy hitters here. Abortion and reproductive rights will surely be a topic during the next legislative session. Do you favor legislation? And if so, what would you support in a bill? And I believe Ms. Maxwell Ostick is starting this time. It is a doozy. It's a very important topic. And I just wanna be very clear that I trust women to make their own health care and family planning decisions. And as a senator for District 4, I would be voting to protect all Nebraskans' reproductive rights. I've been talking with voters, and there's alarm and concern from people from all parties and ages that they do not want the legislature to be interfering with their decisions and um, freedom as far as their bodily autonomy. It is something that I feel very strongly about and would uh, make sure to uh, protect everybody's rights. First of all, I think it was important that the Supreme Court move the final decisions back down to the states. I think that's appropriate. Uh, I also have spent, since I was 18 years old, I've been in the healthcare business, and so I've seen a lot of things both at Burger Mercy and at Children's Hospital. I am a, an advocate, uh, a pro-life advocate, but when you, we have to look and see what particularly is in the legislation. I think another thing that's been very helpful is by not having it in the 30, or in the, for in the last session, we had the opportunity to learn from a lot of the other states who have put in different approaches, whether it's a total ban or it's limited days. So we'll learn from that and collectively we'll come up with something that works for the citizens of the state of Nebraska. I believe that abortion in Nebraska is already highly regulated and to some degree regulated extremely inappropriately. Since I've been in the legislature, we have passed two bills related to reproductive health care that are detrimental to women and those that are pregnant, including the abortion reversal pill, which is based not on science and is very, very dangerous and risky. Also, we passed a what some people call a dismemberment abortion ban. It is a bill that makes it very difficult to have a safe DNC, which anyone who has a late-term uh, miscarriage has to have. I think that it is time for us to trust doctors and to trust Nebraskans and let us make our own health care decisions. I find it extraordinarily dis disappointing and disheartening that we've picked this one issue to legislate medicine. We don't legislate medicine in any other avenue. So um, I agree with the majority of Nebraskans. Um, I believe that this is a decision that is best left to an individual and their medical provider, and I am opposed to any additional restrictions on abortion care in our state. Um, I wanna speak specifically to the danger of some proposals that are out there about um, restricting abortion when the case, but with exceptions. Um, so we hear often about if the mother's life's at risk or if there's a case of rape or incest. And the reality is that these bills are not based in the clinical reality of a clinical decision. So for the case of the exception for the mother's life, the question of course becomes, at what level of risk would indicate abortion care? Would it be a 5% chance of death, a 10% chance of death? And who's making that decision? Is it a medical provider or is it an attorney for the hospital? In the case of rape or incest, the question becomes, what is the burden of proof? Are we going to require the survivor to go through a judicial process, or are we going to take the word at face value? And these are hard conversations to have, but I think it's the reality of some of the nuance that will come up with some of these bills, which is why I'm opposed to any additional restrictions in our state. All right, thank you. 
All right, we're going to come back and start here at the head of the table again. <laughs> what is the best way to address our current criminal justice system pressures, including prison overcrowding, sentencing reform, and restoring voting, voting rights for former felons? Okay, that's a big question for, for 60 seconds. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I think when we come down to criminal rights, the first thing that we have to make sure that we are concerned about, and that is community safety. I also want to go to a little story about prison reform, and that is, and I'll try to be quick here, years ago in the 1970s, we closed all of the state mental health hospitals. Our promise was that we would have community mental health centers, and we never lived up to that promise. So where did all those mental health patients end up? They ended up in state prisons, they ended up in uh, county jails, they ended up in halfway houses. So I want, don't want the same thing to happen with the fact that we all of a sudden start to close down state prisons before we have rehab programs in place that prisoners who want to get their parole have to go through this process. We have failed on that, we failed on it when I was in the legislature before, and we have to address that. We have to be penny wise, not pound foolish. We have to need to spend money where it's most effective and the least restrictive. Uh, Thank you. I'm so, I'm so <laughs> sorry. It is a lot for 60 seconds. <laughs> um, I, I agree that we absolutely need criminal justice reform. This past session, we had a bill that uh, was to implement the recommendations out of the Criminal Justice Institute's report to the state of Nebraska. Unfortunately, we weren't able to move the majority of that forward, and so there's still a significant amount of work to do. We have prison overcrowding, and we cannot build our way out of this. Our prison system does need to be updated. We do need to build a new prison, but not for a larger population. We need to also, at the same time, address the overcrowding issue. I would additionally say that I am uh, completely in favor of giving uh, convicted felons their voting rights. I have multiple times introduced legislation to res remove that from our state constitution to begin with because I don't believe that voting rights should be ever taken away from anyone, especially if laws are being made that impact your lives. And um, I'd like to see us really addressing the jamming out system because I think that's a huge part of why we're seeing criminals back into the system because they don't have those resources if they jam out. Thank you. So the overcrowding of our prisons in Nebraska, it's, it's, it's a true crisis that does need immediate attention. Um, you know, uh, I think Nebraska is one of the most overcrowded prison systems in our country, um, and yet Nebraskans are no more prone to criminal behavior than other Americans. Um, I think we need to look at evidence-based solutions on how to help folks, our neighbors who have experienced incarceration, uh, reintegrate back into society successfully. We need to look into things like supportive housing, uh, access to food, um, education, job opportunities, mental health services. Um, and then, you know, as uh, Senator Kavanaugh mentioned, you know, the Criminal Justice Reinvestment Working Group um, did outline 21 different policy options uh, earlier this year in their report. Uh, there was a missed opportunity to pass some of those in this past session, and I would be interested in picking up uh, some of those suggestions in the next session. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching the legislature this spring and very disappointed that the um, senators did not move forward with some of the very well thought out and careful solutions that were offered. I think that many Nebraskans don't realize that not only are we one of the most overcrowded systems, um, we also have a high proportion and a kind of misbalanced ratio of people within our uh, prison systems who represent from marginalized communities. And we also have a majority of our people in the system who are nonviolent. Many people don't know, and I just realized and found out this last year that it takes $40,000 or so per year for each person that's incarcerated. And I believe that there are many people we could be better using that money for helping them so that they could be productive members in our society. And it would also be helping their families and I'm out of time. <laughs> so, thanks. No, I, I realized that it, we put the two biggest questions next to each other, so prepare yourselves again uh, for, a, for another large question. Um, and I believe, Senator Kavanaugh, you're, you're up here. The president just signed into law the biggest climate change investment in American history. 
which includes funds to help rural communities develop solutions to be resilient to climate change. On a state level, how should Nebraska address climate change? Um, that is a wonderful thing that is happening because climate change and, and the changing of our weather systems is real. Um, we are seeing that across the state right now. And I think that it would be a, a wonderful opportunity for the Nebraska legislature and for the new administration to invest in um, more practices as it comes to agriculture, which is one of our largest industries in the state, that are more sustainable. And th there are opportunities for that. We have given away plenty of tax incentives to corporations. It seems like this would be a great opportunity for us to explore tax incentives for sustainability in our agricultural community. I'd also like to see us doing more investment in energy efficient buildings across the state, but especially in our larger population centers. So we need to take uh, climate change seriously. Um, this is important not only for our sustainability of our planet and the future for our kids, um, but it's also really important for our economy in Nebraska. We are an agricultural state, as Senator Kavanaugh mentioned. Um, we are seeing more and more severe weather events in our state, and we need to be paying attention to that. Uh, I'm a proponent of a statewide climate action plan. Um, I think we need to have one that is um, responsible that is evidence-based uh, and that is reflective of the threat at hand and so I would be a proponent of that and I would want to listen to subject matter experts uh, to determine how to best legislate and uh, pass policy on this. Well I agree. <laughs> I love being in this position because I can <laughs> follow along with what everybody else has shared. The um, interesting thing this last year is that there was a, an interim study passed so that we can really look at this and I will be supporting the legislators that brought that so that we can hopefully move forward with an action plan. This uh, situation here in Nebraska has just been um, a missed opportunity. We have an opportunity to implement a climate action plan similar. Uh, we could move forward. There are other states that can be a model for us. Lincoln has an action plan. They got to work, they've started work on this. Omaha's looking at it, and I think that we just need to move along, roll up our sleeves, and get to work on this for our kids and our uh, state's future. I believe in climate change. Uh, I believe that in global warming, uh, they are now calling it global heating, and uh, I think the Omaha uh, City Council has been recently discussing the idea of a climate plan, and I think that's where you have to start on these things. If you don't, you, you chase yourself too many times. You need to have a plan, you need to prioritize, you need to determine then how much money you can commit to it, and then how you're going to execute it, and in all of that you have to have education, which is critically important in the community. One of the things that troubles me very much about this discussion around climate control is uh, there was discussion some time ago about children that, to children that we were, you only had 12 years left on this planet. And I think that that was terribly inappropriate. Uh, children don't need to be scared. Older people don't need to be scared. And there's, when especially, there's little that you could do in 12 years, so. All right. Uh, we're now going to talk about a topic that is lots of different uh, issues impacting it, so we're focusing on what, what you feel like the most pressing is. Uh, so in K-12 through education in Nebraska, what do you think the most pressing issue is, and what are some ideas to tackle it? Is that me? I'm first? Mm -hmm. I, think. I think so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's about halfway. <laughs> Gosh, the most pressing issue um, in K-12. through um, I, I think things that we really need to pay attention to with education, um, I think it really boils down to how we support our school system. And I think we can think about this uh, tangibly. Uh, so how do we financially support the school system? How are our schools funded? Um, but I also think that we can think about this uh, behaviorally. You know, how are we ensuring that our teachers, our school administrators, our students um, are all feeling supported as well? Uh, we have, um, you know, education is not immune to the issues we're seeing in other parts of the um, 
of the workforce. You know, we have workforce retention issues, and so we need to listen to teachers, we need to listen to school administrators, and we also need to listen to students about what they most need and ensure that those needs are being met um, in the most efficient way as possible. Education drives our state's future. It is what our kids will be taking forward for us as they're building and growing their families. And I believe that one of the most pressing issues is that we need to get back to supporting our teachers and letting them use their expertise and their knowledge. I trust teachers in Nebraska that they're doing a good job by our kids. And I think that there's a lot of division right now that isn't serving our schools well. We also need to make sure and work better to fund our schools and that state formula is something that needs a lot of attention. I've focused on this as a um, citizen and I want as a senator to work to address it as well. I currently serve on the Ralston School Board and so I have some very precise thoughts about this. First of all, I think we have to have more parental rights and authority and accountability. We need more parental engagement. Second, we need to have teacher empowerment in the classroom. The need, teacher needs to be accountable and responsible to make sure that the kids in that classroom that want to learn have the opportunity to learn and the principals need to support those. I'm not a favor, in favor of sex education for elementary school kids. For one year olds or first graders don't have to know that whether they're a boy or a girl. Uh, and fourth, the idea of test scores are deplorable. And there was an article in today's Wall Street Journal that talked about that. It's just a terrible situation. I believe this much. You can have, and I've told our board this, you can have wokeness, but you, it has to be in addition to, not in lieu of, reading, writing, and the STEM courses. really got on that one. Well, well done, well done. I have an answer. To oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Senator. That's okay. Um, I think um, probably the most pressing thing for K-12 education in Nebraska is our workforce crisis. There are so many other things as have been stated by um, my colleagues here at the table, but we need to increase funding. Just like every other industry in Nebraska, our workforce is suffering and the pay is just too low for teachers. We talk a lot about how much we're investing in education and that we're investing too much in this education or that education. But at the end of the day, when you look at the price or that the um, amount of money that we are paying our teachers and our paras and just the staff writ large in within the education system, it's not enough. Oftentimes those people have second jobs or they are on um, social, have to take advantage of social programs. This is our workforce that is taking care of our most valuable resource, and they should be invested in as, the, as though they were as important as they are. Um, I also think that we need to increase access to technology across the state, which is one of the reasons that I love being on the uh, Transportation Telecommunications Committee, so that we can work towards um, access of broadband in our unaccessible areas. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying something, <laughs> and I apologize that I got turned around there in our, in our role here. All right, on to our next question, and we're starting with Ms. Maxwell Ostick, right? I have the order correct this time, all right. Um, what do you think is the most productive way to retain and recruit working people to Nebraska? And I only have a minute. <laughs> As a recruiter and someone who specialized in actually bringing people to Nebraska, I wanna stress that we, op we offer a lot to people. We have a very attractive um, state. There are a lot of benefits and things that are one of the um, top reasons people were interested in our state is the education system. I feel that there are a lot of incentives that we can offer to organizations so that they can support workers not only with um, good salaries but also uh, family support. There are a lot of people who are unable to consider um, certain career paths because of childcare and other kinds of issues that they need um, support in. And I know that there are a lot of uh, companies that would like to offer that. They just need a little uh, help with it. So I think that the smaller uh, organizations in our state uh, will be continuing to drive our economy and I want to help them do that. I think that uh to attract people, we have to make this a very competitive and that goes down to taxes. And I know a lot of people say, well, okay, we only have two million people. 
10 years ago in this state we had 2 million people. We have to grow jobs that will attract and retain young people, but to do that we have to have incentives and we have to compete with states like Iowa and Kansas and Colorado and others. And I don't know that we've done a really good job on that. Uh, we also have to, whether people like it or not, we have to appeal to the executives and the staff and the higher paid people. Uh, they will have to have some amenities to life. I, I think we've done a great job. We have a lot of very generous people in this city and uh, they have given money to the arts and they've given money to a lot of things that will attract and retain. We have good education systems. We have good university systems, Creighton and the Nebraska system. And I can't for, lay about St. Mary's. <laughs> Um, I think that education, access to high quality education for children, um, access to child care, high quality child care for the workforce, affordable child care and affordable housing are essential. If we don't have places for our workforce to come in and live and to send their children during the day, then we don't have a workforce and nobody is going to want to move here after college or when they're in their 30s and they're building a family if there's nowhere to send their family. And so making sure that we are investing first in education and child welfare, child, child care and housing are really essential. But as um, Merv just stated, culture is also important. And I used to work for an arts organization in Omaha, so I understand how important that is to the business community. But also culture as far as having equitable employment laws within the state. And I think if we were to have paid family medical leave in this state, that we would be ahead of leaps and bounds of our surrounding states. Hear ye, hear ye for childcare. Um, <laughs> Senator Kavanaugh and I were joking earlier, my son thought my tie was a thing to swing on before this uh, <laughs> event. So, um, you know, workforce attraction and retention, it's, it's I think one of the biggest issues that's facing um, almost every industry in our state, not just in Omaha, um, but, but statewide. And so, uh, when we think about how are we going to attract workforce, we need to ask ourselves questions like, what are, what is an environment that someone of workforce age is going to want to be living in? Um, what do they value? Uh, can they educate their kids? Um, can they afford their rent or their mortgage? Um, do, is there child care available? Um, is, is the local government actively working to restrict their rights? Um, you know, these are questions that people of workforce age are going to be asking themselves when they get that job offer and they're considering whether or not they want to move to Nebraska um, or if there's someone who was raised here, whether or not they want to um, stay here after, um, uh, it's, you know, to raise their, their family and uh, live their lives in. So these are the questions that I think we need to be asking ourselves. Thank you. There were several bills bought, brought last session and there's been lots of conversation about uh, elections and about um, voting access, uh, things of that nature. What do you think is the primary thing that needs to be focused on when we're talking about um, elections and voters? I think, I think, I think. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm a supporter of the voter ID. We have to have an ID to get on an airplane. We have to have a voter ID or an ID to do a lot of things or most things. So I think that that makes sense to have Tr which builds trust and confidence to maintain a good org uh, state. I think if there is areas of concern that we should be exploring, and that is probably the number of early ballots that go out in terms of how do we follow those and how do we bring those around. Uh, I think, you know, we've, we've worked at it hard. We have a lot of work left to do and we have to build as much trust and confidence to maintain uh, our love and faith for this country. Um, well, I think that Merv and I are perfect yin and yang on this issue. Um, I do not support voter ID. I think that it is going to cause a lot of issues, especially for our aging population. Those that have had their ID, their driver's license lapse for years, if you've been married and you, you changed your name when you got married and you don't have a valid ID, it is ex going to be ex extremely hard to get a valid ID for our elderly population. I've been dealing with constituents that have this for other reasons that they've been trying to get their IDs and it's been a very cumbersome process. I also think that early ballots are a great asset to our state. It, making it more accessible for people to uh, 
exercise their constitutional right to vote is, to me, the most important thing we can be doing as an electorate. So I support having early ballots and no voter ID. So uh, I think it's important to uh, state, you know, Nebraska's elections are safe and secure. Um, our Secretary of State, uh, after the 2020 election, came out with a report indicating as such. Um, I think voter ID is a solution that is looking for a problem. Um, we need to ensure that folks who are eligible to vote in our state do not have any unnecessary barriers to casting their ballot and participating in our democracy. Um, I am a proponent of early, um, early voting, um, vote by mail. Uh, you know, elections are held on Tuesdays. Uh, for folks who work jobs, um, it can be difficult to get to the polls. And so we need to make sure that people who are eligible to vote have access to vote and can exercise that right. So this is such a great question, and it's very near and dear to my heart, actually. I'm a registered a deputy registrar, someone who has actually helped people register to vote. And in Nebraska, we do have very high voter registration numbers, but not everyone is taking advantage of that responsibility. So I think we could do a better job about helping people realize that these people that we're electing will represent us in making decisions for our lives and our livelihoods at all levels. And so I'll make a plug for the League of Women Voters. I use the 411 um, program when I'm filling out my ballot, and I think it's important that we highlight that people can do research and vote early, and um, not only go and take your ballot uh, at your kitchen table if you're doing vote by mail, but you can actually uh, go in early to the election commission. And I would like to expand those hours. I think it would be good to have more evening hours in addition to the weekend ones they already have. And we had amazing turnout during COVID when we sent vote by mail applications to every household that was registered. And I think that we should continue that in addition to not um, having it be postage paid. I think that is something that is also a barrier. All right, we are going to uh, circle back as we're kind of wrapping up our, our topic questions. We're gonna circle back to the criminal justice system because that was a, a big one to tackle. Um, Several of you mentioned the need for uh, services. And so if you could please talk a little bit about what you imagine that to look like, what is kind of the primary focus of providing those um, services needed to those who are in our criminal justice system. Um, so when it comes to services for our criminal justice system, I think it starts before they become part of the criminal justice system. It is important to be investing in um, our social workers, in our behavioral and mental health programs within our school system, and making sure that those that are having those first touches with children that are in vulnerable situations have the resources that they need to make sure that those children are successful and thriving. Um, then the next step would be making sure that our law enforcement are well trained in dealing with those high acuity situations where somebody is suffering from a very severe mental illness and in addition to that, I would like us to divert resources so that there are some social workers or those that are capable of dealing with those situations that are partnered with law enforcement because it is not their job to be mental health providers, but oftentimes they have to substitute in for that. So that's where I would like to see a start and I'm sure others have more to say since I'm gonna stop now. <laughs> I, I, I agree with a lot of what Senator Kavanaugh said. Um, look, I think we need to invest in early childhood education. Uh, we need to invest in, as a social worker myself, I'm a huge proponent of ensuring that we have social workers in our schools to um, enable that type of support. Um, I think we also need to think about resources that we are providing for our community members who have experienced incarceration themselves so that they can be uh, successfully reintegrated into society. Um, so we need to look at things like affordable housing, supportive housing when that's indicated, um, access to medical care, uh, to mental health treatment if that's indicated. Um, we need to ensure that folks are able to, um, to eat, right? So what are um, SNAP benefit eligibility, et cetera, for folks who are um, transitioning out of incarceration? Um, what education, um, work, uh, um, employment opportunities are available? So I, I think there are a number of opportunities for this, and um, I think it would be a worthwhile investment to make. I agree. <laughs> I feel like there's so many things that we could be doing as a state to help prevent uh, people even becoming involved in this system. And one of the things that I think is so important in addition to focusing on mental health 
is the medical uh, health care that we offer on an ongoing basis. There are so many people that are struggling right now. Even with um, expanded Medicaid, we have uh, people who are falling through the cracks, and I think that we need to make sure and focus on that issue. And as far as people who are coming uh, and leaving the uh, prison system, I think that programs like RISE and other uh, offerings like that are something that we could focus on as a state and make sure it's offered not just here in the Omaha and metro area. I want to start out with a, a comment about that I said when we talked about prison, and that is to be penny wise and not pound foolish. And so we need to spend money. I think your original question was on the rehabilitation side. And so part of this is driven by the you know, root causes of school dropouts, drugs, uh, pre need for pre-K education, uh, all of these things to try to prevent the problem from getting to where it's at. Uh, we've tried some of those, we failed at some, but we have to keep be persistent. And I know from when I served before in the legislature, we failed miserably for, to come up with enough programs. And so some of the people would just choose to opt out or jam out as, as Senator Kavanaugh said. And we need to try to move away from that. Uh, we have a lot of uh, work to do. Uh, we have troubled youth. We have gun issues. Uh, we're fortunate we don't have all the problems na that nationally we read about and see about, but we have our problems. Thank you. All right, well, we've finished our content question, so everyone can take a deep breath. Uh, our last question is just to, to get a sense of you. So if you'll just take some time and tell us what your favorite thing about your district is. Is that me? I'm That's first? you. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> my favorite thing about District 20, um, you know, I, I have to say it's the people. Um, you know, I've, uh, the campaign, we've knocked thousands and thousands of doors uh, throughout the district, and that has been one of my favorite parts of, of running this race, is being able to chat with and connect with um, community members and the neighbors. And, um, you know, the thing I love about the people in District 20 is that regardless of what their party registration is or their party affiliation, we all really kind of want the same things. You know, we want our kids to be able to do well. We want our community to do well. We want Nebraska to do well. Um, so I think the people are, are, are the most valuable asset of, of the district. So in District 4, I would say the same thing. I'm sure that this is across the state. But in District 4, as I've been talking with um, neighbors, I've just really been so heartened to find that we do all have so much in common. There has been so much focus on divide, and I think that it is something that has been a detriment to our um, city, to our state. And I think that there are a lot of us that want to move past this division and work together to find solutions. I'm really heartened by the help that our neighbors give to each other, especially coming through COVID these last few years. I really have seen people, you know, just go out of their way to help people and find, um, you know, run errands for them if they need, things like that. And um, I'm glad that I live in District 4. I have in two homes in the district, and I am really proud that we live here. Our husband, my husband and I have the opportunity to live where we want because our business is not dependent on our location. So yeah, we're proud. I've lived in Omaha and Legislative District 12 for almost 40 years and I love Omaha as a city. I think District 12 is reflective of the city of Omaha. It's the home of uh, Mayor Jean Stothard, uh, Legislative District 12. and. The one thing that I think that may be unique to Legislative District 12 is if someone lets a resident from District 12 cut in on traffic, we will give you the friendly wave. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love representing District 6 in Omaha. Um, kind of a joke is that my brother represents District 9 and I say it's just upside down 6. Um, <laughs> but it's it's the heart of the city. It has wonderful people and just great uh, economic drivers. I represent both Crossroads, West Roads, and Costco, so very convenient <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, but it's, a, and I also have Children's Hospital, Methodist Hospital, 
and um, I represent Westside, OPS, and Millard, and so there's just such a diverse uh, economic community, a diverse healthcare community, and so many wonderful public schools that I love representing every day. And there are also some other schools that I represent, um, uh, St. Joan, or not St. Joan of Arc, that would be <laughs> our district, that's where I went, Christ the King, and um, St. Robert's, to name two of the Catholic schools that I represent, and oh, St. Leo's as well, but that's not a school, it's a church, St. Pius is my church, my, my school and church, so. <laughs> Uh, I guess that's it. Well, thank you all so very, very much for being here tonight. Uh, we're going to shift to closing statements and we'll, we'll give you a little longer on these. So <laughs> everybody has um, a minute 30, so feel free to take that time. So we'll just begin with those and uh, then we'll wrap up. I forgot our order. Who's? <laughs> Is it me? I think it might be you. <laughs> I am so proud to be here. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this forum together. I think it's important that voters have a chance to learn more about the people that they're considering to represent their families and their businesses. And I would say that I am not a public speaker, and so this process has been new for me, and I would love for anyone to call me if they had questions I'd like to visit in more detail about any concerns uh, anybody in District 4 would have. I have followed the legislature closely and have been frustrated with some of the opportunities I've seen are, uh, that we've missed. And I want to go to Lincoln and help uh, bridge this divide. As a nonpartisan, I see so many times where we have solutions that have been um, missed because of party politics. And I feel like there is a need for someone who will listen to all of their neighbors, not just the people that belong to the same party. I am someone who is excited about our future here in Nebraska. I think there's a lot that we have to offer for our businesses, for our kids, for our education. And I think that that excitement is something that is missing. It's not supposed to be a place where we go to fight. It's a place that we're supposed to go to find solutions and make our state better for everybody. If anyone has questions, I can be reached at cindyfornebraska.com, and I hope you have a great election. I want to thank the League as well. It's been an engaging process. Uh, I want to talk a little bit primarily about experience. Uh, I think I bring a lot of experience to the table, and part of that is, is having grown up as a farm kid, joined the U.S. Navy right out of high school, came back went to undergraduate school at UNO, went to graduate school at Iowa, came back hospital administrator for 18 years at Bergen, 15 at Children's, served in the legislature, served as chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee, and now on the Ralston School Board. Of, I'm married, I have a son and have two uh, grandchildren, and I am probably most, or as equally as important as many of those, I'm a Nebraska taxpayer. In the process of walking door to door, I started at 144th Street, which is the west end of my district, and I have walked uh, since that time. I am currently, as of yesterday, I'm at about 90th Street, and I will walk the entire district personally. That's not other people walking for me. It's me personally walking that district. And so I'm, I'm committed to that. and. Uh, I feel healthy, I'm energetic. I want to, uh, I like the challenges of the legislature. It's my reason for wanting to go there off of the school board, but I think having served on the school board has been very helpful and given me some insight because most of my background is healthcare. Um, thank you to the League of Women Voters for continuing to put on these types of forums and for your 411, I also use that when I am voting to make sure that I am well informed on all of the issues that are on my ballot. I, um, I appreciate what's being said about sort of the divisiveness. We see it nationally and we see it locally, but I do want to go back and talk about my experience in the legislature. At times it has been very publicly divisive, but there are also times that have been very heartening, especially uh, my freshman year when a senator who um, was in the Republican Party prioritized one of my bills. And it is one of the most important pieces of legislation I feel that I've ever 
been able to accomplish with um, domestic violence and uh, court orders. And after that, then the chair, the a Republican chair of my committee prioritized another one of my bills, and the Speaker of the Legislature helped move several of my bills through. And so again, it's there is partisanship that you see in the public arena, but I want people to know that you do have people within the legislature that are working together, and that nonpartisan nature of our legislature is so essential to that. And I'd also just like to leave with the comment that the role of the government is to serve the people, and if we could do more in the arena of policies of helping lift up people, we would ultimately end up sending more money back to our taxpayers. So that's what I'm gonna focus my energy on. Thank you. Um, again, I'm thankful uh, for the opportunity to be here, grateful to the League of Women Voters for putting this event on. I'm also grateful for my fellow candidates to uh, share this table with. It was a great uh, conversation. Um, you know, I believe that our elections this November are going to be, um, are going to have a really significant impact on what our state looks like in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years. And I think it's crucial that we elect policymakers who are truly invested and interested in creating a bright future for Nebraska. Uh, I'm really proud of the campaign we've been running. We've been laser focused on mental health, education, and workforce retention since we've launched. Um, I believe that I bring a new uh, perspective that's needed to the table in the legislature as a mental health provider, um, and I hope to use that perspective to help create a brighter future for Nebraska. Um, you can learn more about my campaign on my website at johnfornebraska.com, and again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Well, thank you all so very much for joining us tonight. As I mentioned at the top, uh, we really appreciate those of you who have been able to, to join us to speak directly to voters uh, so that they can really hear about your, your policies and what you're hoping to do. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. If you want to learn more about the candidates and the issues that will be on your ballot, you can visit vote411.org for a pers personalized resource tool. There will also be a print version available for Douglas County. A special thank you again to our wonderful candidates for participating in tonight's conversation and our candidates from uh, our last conversation. For the League of Women Voters of Greater Omaha and the League of Women Voters of Nebraska, I'm Rachel Gibson, and as always, be informed and go out and vote on November 8th. Go vote Omaha. <laughs>